Hey guys, on today's episode, I'm going to talk about my top 10 winemaking accessories. In this list, I'm not going to include things that would come with a starter kit. So if you're just getting into wine, I'm not going to include your carboy, your hydrometer, your bucket. Um, because those are things you probably already have if you're watching a video like this. But I'm going to talk about the things that I use most frequently and that make my life a little bit easier as a home winemaker. So we'll start with the bottom of the list and we'll work our way to the most, my most favorite things that I just always am using. So at number 10, I'm going to put this laser thermometer. And it's probably not the most accurate thermometer in the world, but for winemaking, it's more than accurate enough. And I use this thing pretty frequently just to get a check on temperatures of not only the cellar, but especially I'll use it for primary fermentation when I'm really monitoring those wines hard. And I can just walk around bucket to bucket or barrel to barrel and just ping it real quick. Um, I'll, oftentimes I'll actually use a little bit more intense thermometer, um, a data logger, but for ho most home winemaking cases, this is going to be beyond good enough. And I'll mention anything that I list in this list, I'll put a link to it on the bottom in the, the description if you're interested in buying it. Next on my list is going to be a carboy dryer. And this is a store-bought carboy dryer. Um, here's one that, that I made, and I've got a video on how to make this. But these are really super handy. I don't like to leave any water in a carboy because if that water starts to create some mold, it's really going to make your cleaning a whole bunch of hassle. So it's nice just to be able to take your carboy when you're done washing it, you know, you rack your wine off, you rinse it out, just stick it upside down on a carboy dryer. And I wouldn't recommend trying to just like lean it up against the wall. And I did that once and it was a huge catastrophe. I woke up in the middle of the night, it sounded like somebody was breaking into my house and I lost a carboy which cost about $40 which is a big bummer. So a couple options for a carboy dryer and like I said I use those things all the time. Number eight, I'm going to put as my Portuguese floor corker. So if you're getting starting, started in wine, you might have something like one of those little hand corkers with the two levers on it. And they work pretty good, but the, my biggest gripe with those corkers is, um, one, they're a little hard to use. You have to kind of push in and push down really quick. But my even bigger gripe is that they make a like dent in the cork that just doesn't look very nice if you're giving bottles away. So these Portuguese floor corkers, they're about $60. Um, they've got an adjustment here to adjust how deep the cork goes. And they've got an iris that squeezes the cork as it goes in. And I never get that weird denting issue. And they're just pretty simple. Now there's also an Italian floor corker. And it's also great. Um, it's a little bit more expensive and it's got a little bit more leverage. But they're not like night and day difference. I For the price, I really like these little Portuguese floor corkers. Number seven, I'll put as the um, S style airlock. And I really, really love these airlocks. These are pretty much the same airlocks people have been using for a hundred years. And there's a reason why they haven't really changed the design that much. Now there's lots of other innovations around airlocks. So you have little silicone ones that have a flap that moves up as, it, as gas tries to escape. You also have the cup in cup style. Um, and honestly, I've had pretty like mediocre luck with both of those. Um, the silicone ones I think are a little bit too porous. So if you were to leave that wine long term in, in a bung that has one of those silicone airlocks with a flapper, generally you sh you'll get a little bit of oxidation on the top. So I wouldn't recommend using those except for when the wine's actively fermenting and it's really pushing a lot of CO2 out. The cup in cup style, they work fine, but the problem is when the water gets low, uh, it can send air around that bottom cup without you really realizing it because you, you're looking at it, it looks like there's enough water in it. 
but when it's down to about a quarter inch, it can actually let air through. So I don't like that. The S style is just the most easy, the most forgiving. It evaporates really slow. So they work really good. They're one of my favorite little things that I use on just about every single carboy that I've got of wine. Um, next would be a bottle dryer. So every time I'm rinsing bottles, I always like to throw them on a bottle dryer. And this, this is just a little homemade one that I made with a spade bit and a piece of plywood. And this costs you just about nothing if you can find a scrap piece of plywood laying around. They also make the little Christmas tree style ones. And again, those are fine, but if you've got a cordless drill or a drill laying around, you can make one yourself. It's really about a five minute job to do it. And that one I made holds about 20 bottles, which is a pretty good number. Because even if you're drying, you know, you're rinsing before you're bottling, you want to just let, let it drip out. By the time you get to your 20th bottle, your first ones are starting to get dry enough to pull off the rack. Next, I would say, and this one's probably not that exciting, but it's super, super important, is uh, a notebook. So, I'm like historically bad at taking notes in life. But for winemaking, I really write down every single thing I do because the time between steps is so long. I mean, I'll look at a wine a year later and I'm like, I have no idea what I did. Did I add X amount of sulfites? Did I add oak? Did I add tannin? Um, and let's say that wine turns out outstandingly good. Um, you really want to be able to kind of look back and see what you did so you can kind of learn from it on future wines. So a notebook is awesome and you can... Maybe you're the kind of person that works well with digital notes. You can use a program like Evernote or something or just your phone to keep digital notes, which I see as kind of pros and cons. It's nice because you can access the notes anywhere and you'll never probably lose them. But there's something too about just having tangible notes, you know, like this is kind of a junky notebook, but it's something you could pass down to somebody someday if they ever want to get into winemaking, want to look back through some of the stuff you've learned and what's gone well and what hasn't. Number four is a wine thief. So this steals your wine. And you'll see these in wineries a lot, but usually the ones in wineries are a little bit bigger because they're reaching way deep into barrels. I like this size though. This is a nice little one for carboys. And it's, it's nice. You just stick it in the top, stick your thumb over, and pull a sample of wine. Um, it fits through the carboy neck. Some of the bigger winery style ones won't fit through a carboy because they're made for bigger barrel bungs. Before I had one of these, I used a turkey baster. And, or I think that's what it's called, the kind with the little squeezy thing on top. And it it worked okay, but I they just kind of, I could never get one that was reliably sealed and it would kind of like bubble wine out. And also they're a little bit harder to clean. This I can just run some water through, then run some sanitizer through kind of shake it out. It's really, generally stays pretty clean. Now, if you're the kind of person that breaks things frequently, maybe this isn't for you because they are glass and I mean, they're very fragile. I haven't broken one ever, but it'd be kind of annoying if you did because they're about, I think that's about a $30 piece. But again, it's a really nice little thing to have. So now we're getting into the top three and these are probably the things that I use like really constantly I'm using these things. So, and I, I'm trying to decide which ones I would list the highest, but this is the order I put them in. So number three, I'll put um, a gram scale. This is a 500 gram scale, and I use this thing non-stop. So anytime I'm adding anything to wine, I'd rather work in, in weight or mass versus volume, especially with anything powdered that can kind of compact and also, a lot of times you're working with really, really small numbers. Like, you might add, say, 200 milligrams of, you know, SO2 or, you know, it's just such small numbers that you could easily be off by 50% if you're just kind of winging it. So, these are cheap. This isn't even a very nice one. And it's, again, it's probably, if you're in a, you know, CDC lab, you're not going to have this one. But for what we're doing as home winemakers, it's a huge step above using, like, a your teaspoons and things like that to measure. Next is going to be a pH meter and again I use this all the time. The pH is evolving in these wines. You really want to know the pH when you start. You just can't even guess it because you'll taste it and you'll think 
wow, it doesn't taste like there's a lot of acid in this wine, but it just hides with all the sugar and fresh grapes and grape juice. Uh, so the pH meter is huge, and that this is one thing that I don't, well, I mean, you can get a cheap one. It's better than not having a pH meter, but there's kind of a level where all of a sudden it's into relatively accurate. You really want to be accurate to two decimal places with a pH meter with wine uh, because you're oftentimes like the difference between a 3.65 wine and 3.7 in terms of shelf life is pretty significant. So the one I use is from this company Apera and it's still not too, I mean, you can spend hundreds of dollars on these things. So it's probably about the most budget friendly one that I think is accurate enough. It's, it's called the pH 60 and it's also got a replaceable electrode, which is nice. So if you do get a pH meter though, the one thing you definitely want to buy with it is going to be, was going to be a couple things. You're going to want to buy some, um, storage solution. And you're also going to want to buy some pH buffer solution and definitely get a 4.0. And then there's a one that's, I think it's a 7.0 and you can get a third one that's a 12.0 and you can do, on this you can do a three point calibration or a lot of times I'll just do a two point if I'm just um, ballparking. But as I get, you know, when I'm doing the more important measurements, I'll often do a three point and I'll always just kind of check it too before I go to use it. So if I've calibrated it recently, a lot of times I'll just check it with the 4.0 buffer solution. Just make sure that it actually reads 4.0. And if it doesn't, I know it's time to recalibrate again. But this thing is like a total game changer to your winemaking. Uh, so as you get more serious, it's going to be something you're going to really need to buy, whether it's that one or some other brand or if you can borrow one or whatever. Now, number one, it's going <laughs> to... It's probably a little bit less exciting than you're hoping for, but I am like always, always using this and it's going to be a spray bottle. And I keep two spray bottles around. I keep one spray bottle with Star San, which is a no rinse sanitizer. It only needs 15 seconds of contact to sanitize. And I'll keep another spray bottle with a um, homemade SO2 and citric acid solution. So if I'm pulling something out like for instance, I'll put this wine thief away, but I'll always clean it before I put it away. Well, when I pull it out again, I want to give it a little spray. I don't need to do a full-blown insane cleaning, so I'll just spritz it with some star sand, and then I'm really consider it good to go. So these are like super awesome. It it just when at one in doubt, you can just really quickly clean things. You can clean your airlocks anything and and the one with the um, sulfite solution it works as a good cleaner as well but what I use that one especially for is, is if I'm pulling samples off the top of a wine just to test them I like to give it if I'm gonna use a cleaner just before I put that um, bung and airlock back in I like to give it a little spritz with the sulfite and acid solution because it kind of sucks all the oxygen out and also gives it just a micro boost of sulfites from to kind of offset that little tiny tiny bit of air that you introduced and I feel a little bit less scared about pulling the, the bung off to to take a sample of wine so those are my top 10 wine making accessories right now maybe I'll make an updated one of these in the future make sure you're subscribed to to keep your eye out for any of these kinds of videos and more winemaking videos. And I'll probably put a list like this on my website, smartwinemaking.com. So be sure to check that out. And I hope this helps you in your personal winemaking goals. And thanks for watching.